I am Whitney Nordvold and I am the program coordinator for the Great Plains Good Health and Wellness Program. And we would like to thank you all for joining us. And um, uh, we are excited to share today's presentation with you. I just want to give like a few um, housekeeping things and some reminders before we get started. Uh, please make sure that you mute yourself until the end during the questions portion um, of the presentation. Um, I have the ability to mute you in case you forget, but um, we just, it allows for us to hear the presenters clearly and well if you're muted. Um, uh, questions, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat box and then I will ask them um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and then uh, also there will be time for you to ask questions if you're on the phone um, or if you don't think of them till the end. So we'll have a little time for that. Also, I want to remind you that I'll be sharing the um, evaluation or the feedback link at the end. So please uh, fill that out. It allows us to provide um, to provide feedback to our presenters in ways that they are doing well or ways that they need to improve their presentations. And it allows us to serve um, you guys better whenever you do that. So please um, click that link. And it will also be in the email that I sent to you as a follow-up for this. Um, and that will also have a link so that you can come back and watch this presentation um, anytime you want to, a YouTube link. Um, if you're joining us for the first time or you didn't get this um, information to, to join us from me, please um, add your email address in the chat box so that we can invite you to future um, webinar opportunities. Um, so I think that's it for housekeeping and reminders. And I'm just going to uh, introduce our presentation now unless, um, yeah. So uh, today's topic is cervical cancer basics, and we're excited to um, share our own teammates here from the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, Terry Rattler and um, Brenna. Brenna, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> Lanou? Lanou, yep. Ooh, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Shannon's back here tell, whispering to me how to say your name. Um, they work for our cervical cancer and early detection program, I'm sorry, breast and cervical cancer early detection program. And uh, the webinar is going to be talking about the definition of cervical, cervical cancer, the role HPV plays in the development of cervical cancer, HPV vaccination, and ways to identify and reduce the risk of cervical cancer. This uh, webinar is also going to touch on the disparity in cervical cancer diagnosis and morality uh, among American Indian women in the Great Plains region. And um, if you have any questions or anything, we um, are happy to uh, share Terry and Brenna and Kendra, their um, supervisor's information with you so that you can follow up with them on questions you have if you think of them. Um, later. I'm assuming your PowerPoint probably has your contact information in it, guys. Does it? Um, I don't think it does. Okay. Well, we can include those in the email. Too, yeah. So that way people can follow up with you guys. All right. So that's the introduction. I'm just going to hand it over to Terry and Brenna. Thank you, Whitney. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Terry, and I am the program coordinator. And first of all, um, I like to talk about the Great Plains Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program since it, it, is, it is a new program for Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. And so I'm going to be going over that first and then we'll go on to cervical cancer basics. First off, Okay, first off, we want to let you know that January is Cervical Health Awareness Month. So our program is making preparations for Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. 
we have developed and implemented a culturally appropriate social media guide for our organization and other stakeholders to utilize. This social media guide includes Facebook and Twitter recommendations and is available for all of our partners that are interested in increasing cervical cancer screening and HPV vaccination rates in American Indian and Alaska Native community. Please visit our website to request this as a resource if interested. In addition to developing this social media guide, BSEP is sponsoring multiple screenings of Someone You Love, the HPV epidemic in North Dakota and South Dakota this month. So for our today's objectives, um, our goal is for this webinar to present an introduction to cervical cancer. This will, will allow you to discuss the basic relationship between HPV and cervical cancer. Relay the importance of screening guidelines for women and to help spread the word about how to reduce individual and systemic risk factors for cervical cancer. Last June, Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board was awarded a grant to help increase the breast and cervical cancer screening rate in the Great Plains by CDC. Our objective is to provide breast and cervical cancer screenings to low-income American Indian and Alaska Native women in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa. Women eligible for our program include women whose income falls between I mean, below 250% of the federal poverty level who are uninsured or underinsured and are 21 to 64 years old for cervical cancer and 40 to 65 years old for breast cancer. Unless someone has um, a family history of breast cancer or is systematic, um, under 40 should be screened. Our program goals um, is to increase appropriate breast and cervical cancer screenings, which I just spoke about. Um, also to increase screenings um, to work with the tribes in these areas by giving them assistance. And that would be to help them use evidence-based interventions, which are called EBIs. And I'll be saying EBIs throughout the presentation. So once again, it stands for evidence-based interventions. There are three EBIs that will be focused. First one is increasing client demand, and this is done by working with um, clinics or public health nurses and or CHRs or patient navigators with women um, by helping them send out client reminders, doing group education, one-on-one -on -one education, and using small media. The second EBI is increasing client access, which is done by reducing structural barriers, such as transportation costs and reducing out-of-pocket costs. The third one is increasing, increasing provider delivery, and this would include provider reminders and provider assessments. And that means that we would work with providers to see how they work with the screening, how it flows from once the woman walks into the clinic all the way to her screening appointment. And then um, going on with the rest of our program goals, um, at each stage in our program, BSEP focuses on screening, obtaining diagnostic services, and referring treatment services when necessary. In doing that, we focus on three aspects of obtaining medical assistance. The patient, the health system, and the communities in which these two entities interact. BSEP is working on reducing structural barriers that stand in the way or, to complicate, or complicate eligible women's access to breast and cervical cancer screening. And BSEP is, it will be utilizing a patient navigation program to complete this piece. And so Umbrenna is our patient navigator. 
In addressing how the patient and the health system work together, we must address the community. We do this through educational campaigns, social media involvement, and listening to the demand and needs of the community in order to increase access to breast and cervical cancer screenings. On this slide, it's showing you um, health systems changes, and then it goes how we reach out from direct screening, patient navigation, and evidence-based interventions. So we go from screenings to mammograms, pap smears or pap tests, clinical breast exams, and diagnostics. We cannot do treatment services. We cannot pay for any treatment services. So we just like to let everyone know that's one thing that we will not be able to help with. For patient navigation, two groups of women, when it comes to patient navigations, those that are eligible to receive program paid screenings, and then there are low income women who are in insured. It is our program goal to focus on women who might not get screened otherwise. Patient navigation is used to reduce barriers to screening and provide follow up, as well as navigating women to the appropriate location to be screened. <coughs> Comprehensive navigation includes assessing barriers and resolving barriers, providing education and support, tracking and follow-up to women who have been screened or will be getting screened. Multiple contacts between patient and navigator will be made and identify outcomes of patient navigation. Excuse me. And then as I talked about is the EBIs, which is reducing structural barriers, provider reminder systems, increasing client demand. And that's those three. Okay, so our next steps is to work with tribal communities on increasing their screening rates, implement the EBIs with IHS or tribal health, Use community group members to assist in finding eligible women and aid in patient navigation. By providing education on cervical cancer, um, we will be showing someone you love. And if you would like to get um, to see someone you love in your community, please let us know and we will work with you on that. Community members could be other women spreading the information about getting screened by their own experiences, public health nurses or community health workers. And they will be working with the patient navigator here at Great Plains Trouble Treatment Health Board. Now on to cervical cancer basics. Um, the information we have here is we received it from Centers for Di Disease Control and Prevention. So cerv cervical cancer is highly preventable due to screening tests and a vaccination to prevent human papillomavirus, which is called HPV. Cervical cancer develops slowly and begins with a precancerous condition known as dysplasia. Dysplasia is easily detected in a routine pap smear and is completely treatable. And cervical cancer is a tumor <laughs> deriving from cells of the cervix. Sorry, you guys. Um, and this um, photo just shows you um, what it, what's going to be tested for cervical cancer. On to signs and symptoms. Cervical cancer is typically Detect it well before a woman recognizes any symptoms, but if a woman forgoes regular screenings, cervical cancer can go undetected and go into advanced stages where a woman may discover that she has the following symptoms. And this could be bleeding that occurs between regular menstrual periods, bleeding after sexual intercourse or a pelvic exam, menstrual periods that last longer and are heavier than before, Bleeding after going through menopause, increased vaginal discharge, or pelvic pain. There are many potential causes for these symptoms, so it is very vital that if you experience any of these, that you discuss them with your doctor. 
Cervical cancer is the second most diagnosed cancer in women worldwide. However, it is extremely preventable through the practice of regular screening. Overall, American Indian women are nearly twice as likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer as white women. This disparity continues to grow as we focus on the mortality rate from cervical cancer of American Indian and Alaska Natives nationwide to the region in which the Great Plains is contained. In the Northern Plains, seen here in yellow, American Indian and Alaska Native women die from cervical cancer at a rate that is 4.2 times higher than whites. These numbers indicate a huge necessity for the increase in breast and cervical screening in the Great Plains. In our four state service area, currently facilities are reporting a 46% screening rate across North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska combined. The national screening rate for all races is 83%. This disparity needs to be eliminated and American Indian women and their families no longer have to suffer, suffer from cervical cancer. Our program will address both the health system issues and individual risk factors that contribute to a cervical cancer diagnosis. On to risk factors. A woman has an increased risk of developing cervical cancer if any of the following are true. She has HPV, which causes nearly all cervical cancers and two types in particular are attributed to nearly 70% of all cervical cancer diagnosis. If she smokes, having HIV or any other condition that may make it harder to fight off infection, prolonged use of birth control pills, having given birth to three or more children, and having multiple sexual partners. By achieving and maintaining a healthy weight can reduce your risk of most cancers, including cervical cancer. One way to do this is to ensure that you are incorporating 30 minutes of moderate activity into your daily schedule. Great Plains Tribal Tournament's Health Board Community Health Prevention Team has many resources for educating individuals on how to accomplish this. Contact our Chronic Disease Self-Management Education Program for details. Next limit, alcohol intake. Currently, it is recommended that women not exceed one alcoholic beverage per day and men not exceed two alcoholic beverages per day, but the best course of action is to avoid alcohol totally. This is the case for commercial tobacco as well. The relationship between lung cancer and tobacco use is widely known, but commercial tobacco use plays a role in, in the development of nearly all cancers. Quitting commercial tobacco as soon as possible if you use it will greatly reduce your risk. But ensuring that you advocate for commercial tobacco-free lifestyles will aid the next generation in reducing their risk before it becomes an issue. Waiting to have sex until you are older can help you avoid HPV. It also helps to limit your number of sexual partners and to avoid having sex with someone who, is, who has had many other sexual partners. The most effective way to reduce your risk of cervical cancer is to get the HPV vaccination at the recommended time. We will discuss additional HPV vaccine recommendations later in the presentation. If individuals are sexually active, they should ensure that they are practicing safe sex. This not only reduces the risk of contracting cancer-associated HPV, but it also reduces the risk of contracting HPVs that can cause genital warts as well as other STDs. The best way to reduce your risk is to get screened. This means women should get PAP and HPV tests as recommended. Some of these risk factors you cannot change, like sex history or having a compromised immune system due to a chronic condition. Even though you may have Many of these risk factors screening can help reduce them. Follow screening guidelines and do what you can for your overall health and you will be able to reduce your risk of cervical cancer. I will now turn the presentation over to Brenna, our patient navigator. Okay. Hello. Um, 
So the number of sexual partners that a woman has had can increase her cervical cancer risk because it increases her risk of getting HPV. And in turn, this increases the chances of contracting a cancer-causing type of HPV. While most HPV types clear up on their own over the course of a couple years, in the case of cervical cancer um, causing types, they develop into cancer over the course of seven to 10 years, maybe even 15 years. Um, so regular and timely screening is essential in order to combat other um, non-changeable and non-behavior, uh, like changing risk factors, sorry. Um, and cancer-causing types of HPV can also cause uh, genital, or no, that's not right, okay. So you can pass HPV onto your partner when you are not showing any symptoms and um, the age of uh, your first sexual experience can contribute to your cervical cancer risk as well. Um, and it's been shown that starting sexual activity before the age of 16 could increase an individual's cervical cancer risk. Um, another um, thing that contributes to a higher than average risk of cervical cancer is if your current partner has had a previous sexual experience with someone who's had cervical cancer. Um, this means they could have been exposed to a cancer-causing type of HPV. Even with condom use, HPV can infect areas around the genitals that are not protected by a condom. In addition, if a woman has had her first full-term pregnancy prior to the age of 17, her risk is increased. While in an individual's sexual history is not the only determining factor in whether or not they are at risk for cervical cancer, it's important to be aware of the role that your sexual history may play in your risk. Um, and becoming knowledgeable about this can help inform your screening schedule and patient-doctor relationship. So inform your healthcare provider about your sexual history. And um, it's just good to be aware of how it affects your cervical cancer risk. Uh, this um, puts you in charge of your health and gives you the power to do all that you can in preventing cervical cancer. So what should you do now that you know about cervical cancer's risks and incidents? Well, get screened and share this knowledge with other women who may be unaware. So when should you get screened and who should get screened? Um, well, first of all, screening for cervical cancer means getting a pap test and, um, or an HPV test. And we'll cover those um, in a couple slides here. So, Routine screening offers the best way to find cervical precancers, which can be treated to keep cervical cancer from developing. It's also the best way to find cervical cancer early, when it's small and has not spread. Um, finding cancer early gives you a better chance for successful treatment, and according to the National Cerv Cervical Cancer Coalition, deaths from cervical cancer in the United States continue to decline approximately 2% a year. This decline is primarily due to the widespread use of the pap test to detect cervical abnormalities and um, the allowance for early treatment. Most women who have abnormal cervical cell changes that progress to cervical cancer have never had a pap test or have not had one in the previous three to five years. And 50% of women diagnosed with cervical cancer have never had a pap smear. So how a woman can prevent cervical cancer changes throughout her lifespan, um, oh, cervical cancer changes throughout her lifespan. The best way to prevent cervical cancer is to get vaccinated in adolescence. Um, individuals can get vaccinated through the age of 26 for women and through the age of 21 for men. But the vaccine is most effective at the age of 11 or 12. And at 21, a woman should start to get her pap test every three years. Um, no HPV testing is necessary at this uh, age due to the viruses um, uh, being so widespread and the natural process of the virus. Most women have a um, non-cancer causing form of HPV in their 20s and it typically clears up on its own. Once a woman enters her 30s, she should begin co-testing every five years. This is when a woman receives a pap test and an HPV test. Um, and since cervical cancer is most often found in women over the age of 30, this is when the cells that are infected most likely begin to change or become infected. Cervical cancer develops very slowly and is best caught when regular testing is done. 
there are cases where your physician may not require you to receive the HPV test. In this case, you will continue um, just getting a pap test every three years. Um, and after uh, 65, cervical cancer risk drops dramatically and testing is no longer recommended. So what is a pap test? Um, a pap test is when a doctor collects cells from the surface of your cervix to be tested for any changes or abnormalities. Um, early detection via a pap test allows the doctor to um, see if you may need further testing or to potentially remove any abnormal cells found. A pelvic exam is not the same as a pap test. A pap test tests cells of the cervix for changes, and a pelvic exam is when a doctor checks the health of the entire uh, system. A pap test can be considered a part of a pelvic exam. You can only receive a pap test at a clinic or doctor's office compared to um, other screening options for breast cancer, say uh, like mobile mammography. So what happens uh, when you receive abnormal pap test results? Well, you can receive a couple of uh, kind of uh, results here. So first we have an abnormal pap with an HPV positive test. Um, getting a result like this does not mean you have cancer. Um, what this means is that you will need to follow up with your physician for further testing um, and potentially have the cells removed to prevent the development of dysplasia. Catching these cell changes early is very important. Um, uh, ASCUS stands for atypical squamous cells. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. And it is the most common result of abnormal PAP results. And then we have an abnormal PAP in an HPV negative test. Um, what this means is that abnormal cells were found during the PAP test, but no HPV was found. You will likely need further testing to figure out why the PAP and HPV test differ. This might be through colposcopy. Um, and then if you have a normal PAP uh, with a negative HPV test, um, this means that the occurrence of HPV in your cervix is unlikely, your cervical cells are normal, and your chance of getting cervical cancer in the next few years is very low. Talk to your doctor and determine if you should return for co-testing in five years or only a PAP in three. So HPV is a sexually transmitted virus that can cause genital warts and is attributable to six types of cancer. Perhaps the most well-known link between an STD and cancer is that of cervical cancer and HPV. Also known as human papilloma virus, um, it's extremely common and it, in fact, it is estimated that 79 million individuals are infected with HPV in the United States. It's often referred to as the common cold of STDs, um, but if this virus is left unmonitored, it can lead to cancers and genital warts. Um, yeah, and nearly 80% of people will come into contact with the virus in their lifetime, and um, that's why the HPV vaccine and testing are so important. So, the relationship between HPV and cervical cancer um, is well known, but there are over 140 types of HPV. So it's the types that are um, considered high risk that cause cervical cancer. So the ones that cause cervical cancer nearly 70% of the time are HPV 16 and 18, but in addition to those two high-risk types, there are HPV 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 that are also considered um, high-risk types. It's the low-risk types that you find um, that clear up on their own or that may cause genital warts. So one of the best ways to reduce your risk of cervical cancer is to get the HPV vaccine. Um, the HPV vaccine protects against the types of HPV that most often cause cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. Um, this vaccine is recommended for uh, preteens, boys and girls, um, at ages 11 and 12, but it can be given as early as age nine and until the age of 26 
for most women. Um, it's given in a series of either two or three shots. This depends on the age at which the first uh, dose is given. Um, it also depends on the uh, immune system of the person receiving it and um, whether or not they've been exposed to HPV already. Um, even if women are vaccinated for HPV, they still need to have regular pap tests to screen for cervical cancer. Um, and there are some groups that may be eligible for the vaccine outside of these recommendations. So if you're interested or know someone who might be interested in getting the HPV vaccine, um, have them talk to their doctor or talk to your doctor about your eligibility for the vaccine. So what is an HPV test? So this is similar to a PAP, but this is a test which collects cells from the surface of the cervix to check for the uh, HPV, for HPV. The cells are collected the same way as for a PAP test. Um, the results can help the doctor decide if more testing is needed or um, if you have a higher risk, high or low risk type of HPV. Women under 30 should not get the HPV test um, because usually HPV found in women under 30 clears up on its own. Um, and women over 30 should receive the HPV and PAP test together every five years. Um, so just to reiterate, HPV testing and PAP testing, the, um, the procedure is the same, but what they're looking for is um, two different things. So a PAP test looks at cells over, over time and to, to find changes, and an HPV test just tells you if you're positive or negative for, the HP, for an HPV type. So when to get screened. This is the big takeaway we want um, people to share with your friends, your family, women you know. Um, this is really important because cervical cancer is uh, really preventable, especially with the vaccine and all of these screening measures. So um, a regular pap test should begin at age 21 to 65 years, every three years until the age of 30. Then the CDC and the USPSTF, the UVET, what is it, Terry? United States Preventive Services Task Force. Thank you. Um, they recommend that co-testing happens every five years. Um, so once you've gotten one of these tests, when is it normal to receive results? Uh, it can often take up to three weeks. Um, if the test shows something that isn't normal, uh, your healthcare provider will contact you and figure out how best to follow up. If tests show cells that are not normal, your healthcare provider will let you know if you need to be treated. Okay, so as Terry mentioned, we are um, sponsoring screenings of someone you love in several locations across uh, North Dakota and South Dakota. Um, and it is a very touching documentary about cervical cancer and the women who have, you know, experienced this diagnosis. So we would really like to show you guys the trailer. So I hope that this works. So I'm gonna just see. don't realize how dangerous this virus is and we will take you out to the cemetery and show you our daughter's gravestone. I wish we could have caught this whole thing sooner so it never would have turned out the way it did. I was angry. Um, hold on, everybody. We'll get it back on track here in a minute, or hopefully less than a minute. Hey, Whitney, were we having a problem? Yeah, it's frozen. Okay, um, we uh, so we just won't show the um the trailer. Um, you guys can find it on on YouTube if you're interested in seeing the trailer. Um, can you put the link in the chat box? Yes, I can. 
Thank you. There we go. If you guys are talking, we can't hear you. Okay, yeah, we're just uh, trying to find find the link here. Sorry. Um, yeah, we'll put it. Uh, we're gonna finish the, our last two slides here, and then we'll add it um, when we're done. Okay, so. Like I said, we're showing um, this documentary in South Dakota and North Dakota, and we do have, um, we have uh, licenses for this film if you're interested in showing it and need help um, in getting that licensing. So uh, you can contact our program manager for that. And um, oh, we actually do have our contact info on the next page here. Our presentation. Oh, there. there we go. All right. Um, so, I guess if you're interested in someone you love, you can just uh, you can email me, Brenna, and I can forward that to Kendra. Um, but we also have quite a few other resources available. Um, so, if you want further information on our program on breast and cervical cancer, or to request these materials. Um, you can uh, contact me or Kendra, and that's Kendra.Roland, R-O-L-A-N-D, at gptchb.org. Um, and we also have a newsletter that we uh, produce monthly. So if you're interested in finding out more about what we're doing in our communities or um, have events that you'd like to share, um, you can let us know. Um, and some of the uh, resources that we have available for Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. We have a social media guide that has suggested posts and um, hashtags. Uh, that way we can have it all together. We can find each other's posts and things like that. Um, we also have fact sheets, um, one on HPV vaccination, one on the myths associated with um, HPV vaccination, and um, one on cervical cancer itself. So I want to thank you guys for joining us and going on this educational journey. And we are very thankful to have gotten to present to you. So thank you. Thanks, Terry and Brenna. Um, we are going to move into questions now. I have one in the chat box that I'll ask. And then if anybody else has questions, we can go ahead with those. Okay, um, perfect. Question was asked, what if a male started the vaccine but did not complete it for medical reasons such as chemotherapy? Can the male restart the series or are they no longer able to receive the vaccine? <clears throat> um, I think that really would depend on your doctor's recommendation. Um, what we know from the CDC is that you aren't fully protected from cancer causing HPV unless you are fully vaccinated. So with the issue of being immunocompromised and not finishing the vaccine, that is something that I think the patient and doctor should determine on an individual basis. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions um, from any of the viewers? or attendees, I guess you people are. <laughs> um, I wrote down a couple questions. Um, Terry, at the beginning, you talked about your program working with the underinsured. How is that defined? What is somebody who's underinsured? That is when you have um, health insurance 
but it doesn't cover screenings. Okay. So then it just would like cover, let's say a physical, but it doesn't go any further than that. Okay. Um, and then Brenna, can you describe uh, the patient navigator's role a little bit more detailed? Um, and maybe how does somebody get connected with you or a patient navigator? Like what does that relationship look like? Um, so what I do as a patient navigator is I try to help and reduce some of the barriers an individual might uncover when they are trying to get a screening. So one thing that we, we try to do is we try to ask patients what their individual barriers are. And we've found in our communities that transportation is sometimes an issue. So this could mean trying to get um, mobile mammography to them in the case of breast cancer screening or in the case of cervical cancer screening, finding programs that may help them uh, be able to pay for transportation or that provide for transportation. Um, so stuff like that, yeah. Okay. There's another question in the chat box and it says, oh, thank you for the answer, Brenna. Um, since you aren't able to help financially with treatment options for patients, where do you direct those who don't have the ability to pay for, for them? To the state programs, if they qualify, um, and they have each state in the fourth state region have their own eligibility guidelines that they follow. Um, Otherwise, we can, our patient navigator can help them find other resources um, in helping them find a way to help pay for their treatment. So it just depends on where they're from um, and what's available in their community, basically. Yes, mm -hmm. like even they could ask the tribe and see if the tribe could help them, um, like getting to their treatment by providing a gas voucher or having them um, have a ride for if tribal, if tribes own their own vehicles to, you know, give them a ride. So utilizing local CHR programs, those kinds of things? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? I don't even know what they're Okay. We still have a few minutes. This is Karen with the uh, Cancer Programs Director with the South Dakota Department of Health. Has the Great Plains uh, Breast and Cervical Early Detection Program begun screening women through, the net, through this program? No, we haven't. Um, we just um, received the grant and we're still going through some um, paperwork and um, trying to build up some partnerships with tribes out there to um, to see if we can work with any of them that might be interested. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing that I was thinking about earlier on, ladies, whenever um, at the beginning when you were uh, Brenna describing risk factors. Can you um, differentiate between a risk factor and a cause of cancer? Because I think there's kind of some of the description. For me, somebody who's not familiar with it, um, causes and risk factors are different. And is that true for, for much of the stuff that you were talking about on that risk factor slide? Sure. So it, it kind of, it gets a little murky when you want to talk about like causes of cancer um, because you've got a lot of stuff in like the environment, um, a lot of behaviors. So I think the issue is that they're not quite sure exactly what causes it, at least from, this is my personal, like from doing some of the research on this topic. Um, the CDC calls some of those things that we might associate with like causing cancer, like smoking, they list it as a cervical cancer risk factor. So that's the language they're using. Um, 
But that's a really good question. And that's something I would be curious to know how, how they develop that, the difference between a cause and, and a risk factor. So I'm not quite sure. I hope, I hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, if there are no further questions, I think we'll just wrap up. I'd just like to thank um, Terry and Brenna for their time and the energy they put into this presentation. Um, we appreciate you taking the time today and um, all the work that you guys do uh, for the Great Plains area. We're really grateful for you and, and for um, everything you do. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Whitney. You're welcome. Um, and so I just wanted to remind you guys, I am going to put the evaluation link um, in the chat box here in just a second. So please take a second to click that and um, fill out our feedback uh, survey so that we know how well we did or didn't do or any suggestions that you have for future webinars. Um, also, um, at, if you are not uh, receiving invitations from us already to attend future webinars, please put your email address in that chat box also. Um, and our next webinar is February 14th on Valentine's Day. And we're gonna be talking about coalition building. Um, and so this would be a really awesome one for um, any of you communities, that, uh, any of you guys that are sub-awardees for the Great Plains Good Health and Wellness Program, this would be a great one to invite um, your um, coalition members to be a part of or sit in on, um, or any other programs that you can think of in your communities where um, coalitions or an advisory type committee um, is important to the work that they're doing. Um, so yeah, I will send out a follow-up email with that feedback link also. And um, Brenna just shared the YouTube video, um, which is the trailer for that HPV, um, I mean, for the cervical cancer um, uh, documentary that they were talking about. I'll put that in the email also. So thank you all so much for um, coming today and we appreciate you all and the work that you do in your communities. Um, any questions at all, just you can follow up with me or um, anybody on the Good Health and Wellness team and you guys all have a great day.